Here we are for another episode of The Speakeasier. How are you doing today, Simone? I'm excited for this convo. How are you? Good, excited. So we've got Simon Cook, the CEO of Lions, joining us today. We've worked with Simon for a couple of years now, and he's really leading the charge of what can Lions needs to look like across the organisation. What are you looking forward to getting into, Simone? I guess with the pace of industry change, Simon's just got a unique perspective about what that means. 70-year-old organisation, where's that going to go in the future? Yeah, just really interested in his insights. Well, let's get Simon on. Simon, welcome to the Speak Easier. We've had the absolute delight of working with you over the last couple of years in all things inclusion and creativity. Before coming on to here, actually, I asked ChatGPT, why do marketers struggle with inclusion? And there are lots of reasons which we will go into as part of this. We have invited you on because we love the work that we've been doing together, but also you're someone in the industry who's spearheading ED&I in many ways. So thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the invite. Looking forward to the chat. And also because we love the voice of real humans alongside our AI friends. <laughs> yeah, can't wait to get your opinions and views. But something that we start with is, you know, we talk a lot about origin stories um, in the world of ED&I, and particularly at the Unmistakables. And really, we're asking our guests, how did you get to be where you are today? You know, what's a bit of your history, the roads that you've taken? We know that our listeners are going to be really interested just to get a bit of a window into your life. For sure, yes. God, thinking back a bit. Well, I come I come from a creative background. So in, in many ways, I am a failed agency creative. I wear that badge with pride. But fundamentally, everything that I've done from then up until now has been powered by the fact that I value creativity. So I think it has such an interesting impact on people and their careers, on businesses, of course, and we can get into that later. But also, and it sounds cheesy, but the world around us, it genuinely has an influence there. And I think today it's one of the most underrated business tools that we have. The opportunity that came up to work with Cam Lyons when I'd hung up my hat um, and moved away from agency life was really exciting because, you know, it was meant to be a stopgap where I would be exposed to all of this incredible work from around the world before moving on to another agency. And that never happened. So I um, have stuck with Cam Lyons for a long time. I've been there for about 15 years. Um, and I'm committed to it very much so because of the unique position that we hold in the industry, which is a real privilege. And because of the responsibility, but also the opportunity that we have so, you know, the work that we've done together on our juries, and we'll get into that, our juries hold up the gold standards of our industry. And that's exciting because, you know, on the one hand, it captures a moment in time and it builds on a legacy. We've been running for 70 years now, but also it gives us a glimpse into the future of creativity as well. So it shows us the way forward to some extent and also reminds us of the impact that creative marketing, when done well, can have not just within our industry, but in the real world around us. And that's a responsibility that we take very seriously. And as I said, it's a, a privilege and I love it. So what was the spark into creativity in agency world? Because lots of people say, how do I get into an agency <laughs> or what's the pathway? I'm curious what that was like. Yeah, it was, it was slightly accidental, if I'm honest. I studied graphic design at university and I really didn't know what I wanted to do. One thing I did know is that what brought me energy and the thing that I liked the best is when I was building, when I was making, when I was putting new things, hopefully meaningful things into the world. And, um, you know, did a bit of experience at agencies because people thought that I would like it. And I did. But ultimately, it didn't feel quite right. And I don't think I was good enough, to be honest. And so taking that break and trying something else and being exposed to all of the creativity at Can Lions was hugely appealing. And the rest is history, as they say. Fast forward to today. What's the surroundings you're in? What's your mindset? What, what are you feeling at the minute as we're getting to the end of the calendar year? But acknowledging it maybe is the start of your planning year for next year's Can Lions. Yeah, indeed. I think September, October, 
for us, obviously, we're thinking about budgets and planning and strategy for next year, which is always really exciting. And reflecting on, on the year that's, that we've had. So as you said, really starting to think about how to evolve, how to, to innovate. That's something that's very important to us. But also just thinking about the, the broader responsibility and opportunity we have with Lions, which has expanded recently. We've brought in new companies that now come under that banner. And so there's a big job to be done in really thinking about how we use the collective strength, the brands that we have to further that opportunity. And that feels really exciting. So I feel excited. Um, I feel impatient. I want to get into next year already, but mostly just excited because it feels like there is a good energy around what we're doing and in the industry right now. I was just thinking that the brand is 70 years old and we know that you celebrated that 70th anniversary this year. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you keep the sort of energy and enthusiasm for a brand that has that kind of heritage and thinking about the pace of change that we're in at the moment? And how do you harness all of that and, and really look forward? Yeah, I, I love that question because there's a dual aspect to it. So one of the things that we really try to do is honor our heritage and where we've come from, but also constantly looking ahead. So, you know, we, we believe that creativity and innovation and constantly evolving, not for the sake of it, but for the right reasons, is really important. Um, also because we are reflecting the industry landscape in many respects. So there is an expectation there for us to not keep up, not just keep up, I should say, but also sometimes help pave the way forward with the new awards that we introduce, the different platforms and forums we create, um, not just at the festival, but increasingly throughout the year as well. I've written down the word representation and underlined it because we have loads of conversations about this at the Unmistakables about where is the starting point? What we were talking about last week at our recharge event was how much does representation move us forward versus how much can it hold us back sometimes? So in the political climate, a lot of people are saying, well, it's representation politics. For example, you've got people who have different kind of skins spewing certain things where if it was coming from someone else, maybe it would be looked at differently and is representation therefore a good thing in inverted commas. And one of our consultants, shout out to Selena, is always saying we have to move beyond representation. We have to be thinking about that. I'm wondering from your conversations with agencies and in the industry, do you think that's where the industry is at today? Like with really thinking about representation and maybe waiting for what goes deeper than that it can be a sense of inclusion or it can be things that are less skin deep. I think the conversation around representation has, there's, there's a quietness right now. I think it was really being talked about quite a lot, obviously following the death of George Floyd and when there was the rise of recruitments being made in the diversity, equity and inclusion space. But I think the conversation needs to evolve as well. We talked a lot about this idea of um, relevancy and I think that's really powerful. The idea that we should all be, you know, having DEI at the heart of our organizations, but the reason we're doing that is to remain increasingly relevant. One of the things that that I've observed over the last few years is that there's a lot of leaders out there that have leaned on the business case for DEI and perhaps too many that have neglected the moral case for it and just accepted that we'd, we should do it because it's the right thing to do first and foremost. But also I think the opportunity is to really start thinking about it in terms of relevancy. Certainly something that we are, are trying to get our head around. We're a global business. You know, it would be actively damaging to our own brand if we didn't put DEI at the heart of everything we do. Otherwise that is going to erode this kind of global status that we have because of our lack of relevance with certain markets and customers and individuals. I'm wondering what that means for you, Simon, in terms of putting it at the heart of everything you do. How does that actually manifest when you've got decisions to be made or different kinds of projects and initiatives? A bit like the, the work we've done together with our jury compositions. You know, if you think about the people that we're trying to bring together, the different experiences, lived experiences, voices, perspectives, preferences, we're doing that because we believe that the people in that room should represent society rather than reflect the industry. And let's face it, the industry has got a long way to go. 
So I think just trying to emulate that approach in everything that we do, make sure that when we are making decisions and often important decisions, that we are having different voices, different perspectives, different types of people in the room to include them, but also because we believe that the outcome and the decision will be better because of the contributions and diverse contributions that we're going to get. Yeah. Did, yeah. You, did you see that play out this year, Simon, in, in the judging process? Yeah, well, off the back of the work we did together, and we can, we can get into you know, the compositions that we have and, and the thinking that we put behind our juries. Um, this was the most diverse lineup of jurors we've had in our 70 year history. And what was really encouraging to hear is that off the back of that experience, a lot of our jurors were feeding back to us that the nature of the work has shifted as a result. So the work that they're holding up now is best in the world, best in class is a very different type of work to what we would have seen if we hadn't made those changes which is really exciting to see. And then, you know, the byproduct of that is that this year we had Nigeria winning its first ever lion on the global stage. And that is because of a lived experience and perspective that one individual brought to the room. That is a fact. And that is incredibly exciting, especially when you can see the relevance that is bringing to that part of the world. It's really interesting now how our customers from Nigeria are starting to engage with us in a way that they hadn't before. So yes, the nature of the work is shifting, but that idea again of greater relevance because of the outcome of the awards this year is exciting to see. I think that really felt so inspiring that actually there's a bit of a, I guess just a bit of role modeling. I know you'd be maybe too humble to say it's Simon, but actually setting a standard for what can be done if you double down on the effort and the intent and actually do go searching. Because we hear so often people saying it's hard to find the talent, but actually it's hard if you're not looking in the right places. What are some of the things that your teams have had to do differently in order to really embrace this change and make it manifest in what happened this year? Like we've talked about often, that inside-out approach is so important. I think when we, as Can Lions, talk about DEI, they go straight to, oh, it's their product that they're talking about. So it's the changes they're making to their juries and how they perhaps cast people for the, the stages and talks that they do. And product's important, as is the, the greater influence that we have and can affect. But internally is where it has to start. You know, obviously... We've worked with you guys and thought about how we need to train our staff and, and educate them and change mindsets where, where necessary. And that's an ongoing process. But also it's about providing ongoing resources and tools. So it's really saddening to hear that there are dedicated DEI roles that are slowly disappearing as budgets become tighter at a time when that's exactly what businesses should be focusing on because of the greater relevance it will bring because it will help them grow. And so one of the things we have done is recruited your help, a dedicated diversity, equity and inclusion officer. And Frank, Frank Starling, hi Frank, if you're watching, has been an absolute revelation and is such a support team. But also um, because he is, well, he sits on our leadership team, he reports to me and works very closely with me on the business strategy. And I think that mm. is baking DEI into the business strategy rather than it feeling like a clumsy add-on or a siloed department who is just there to train when needed. That helps put DEI at the heart of everything because it, it comes back to our core KPIs as a business. One of the things that I'm hearing, I went to a Chartered Institute of Marketing event this week and, and we ran a couple of breakouts on d and in marketing and the fear of getting it wrong played up a lot. There's a stat, I think, from the Stereotype Alliance last year, 64% of marketers are scared of getting it wrong, which is why they then, then do it. But the big thing that was coming out of this CMO 75 report was budgets as the first bit, which in the context of today makes sense, but skills and the skills gap that exists in the field of marketing, which I suppose can Lions and Lions in general played quite a big role in, right? In providing marketers and creatives with the skills. And I wanted to then just hone in on what you said about creativity leading to business impacts. 
and what you see, what is either that dotted line or that direct, we did this, it was more creative and it led to that. Yeah. I mean, that's fascinating and something that we delve into every year with the winners from Can Lions. Um, so we've been able to prove time and time again, that lion winning creativity outperforms non-lion winning creativity. So it's proven to be more effective. Yeah. Uh, and so that helps marketers who come to the festival and, and engage and helps them build the case for creativity, which should already have been won many years ago, but unfortunately not. It, it has to be remade a lot all the time. So whatever we can do to provide the evidence, the tools, the insights that help people do that, the better. And that is something that we really focused on at the festival this year. There was a whole section of our content dedicated to creative impact because a lot of the marketers who are coming are coming for that reason. They want the ammunition to be able to go to their C-suite and say, look, be the money for this organization to be more creative because ultimately it's going to drive our business. I, f I find it really fascinating because there's a lot around, you know, stereotypes, cultural appropriation and appreciation, but there's also people I hear who say, God, my, my agency and my team, they, they just want to do it for a lion. They just want to try and create this piece of work just to win a lion. And I can understand why. And having worked in the agency, I've definitely been in those conversations. But what you're saying is, well, yeah, just do it for the lion because it's going to help the business. The thing I say is the aim should be creating better, creative, more impactful work. So aim for that and the lions will come. Like the lion should be a byproduct of raising your own bar rather than being the sole focus because I, I, you know, that can lead to a very muddy situation. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it was just a very live conversation a couple of weeks ago where someone's having to tell the agency, like, we just need to create some direct response, digital advertising. It doesn't need to win a lion, <laughs> win a lion. Well, oh, yeah, mean, but I guess if they're, they're setting that as the benchmark because they know that that is what leads to the best performance, then actually it's the same thing. Mm, very true. But to your point, I think it's really interesting that we're starting to see the rise of what people might consider to be boring work, winning at Can Lions. Go on. Mm. Well, just nature of the work is changing. So, you know, years ago, it really was just film and outdoor and print and traditional advertising, craft and creativity and campaigns. But now we recognize everything from that right through to commerce, business transformation, innovation. So really, you know, about the internal operations of a business as well. And, you know, in a space like health, which we introduced a few years ago, you see there are huge constraints there, massive legislation. It's really hard to be creative in this space. But um, by introducing that new benchmark for the health community, it helped bring that level up. It's given people examples that they can now hold up as saying, look, they did it, we can do it too. And it is going to help drive performance at the end of the day. I'm struggling to move on from be boring to win a can lion. That's what, <laughs> that's what I'm bringing in. Well, I think in the last few years, there's been a real um, prevalence around purpose or purpose led work. Right. Yeah. 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 It would be very sexy. And, you know, it's, um, it's very easy to attach yourself sometimes clumsily to some kind of social cause. So, you know, we're going to sell a product and save the dolphins all at once. Yeah. <laughs> But it's actually really hard to, to sell a product without those bells and whistles and gimmicks. So I think what we're seeing is a bit of a renaissance and a return to the fundamentals of marketing, because let's face it, they've worked for a really long time. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering something that I noticed when I was at Can last year, um, obviously TikTok have a really big presence there. And in one of the windows, they had a big poster that talked about everyone is a creator and when I speak to my daughter who's 13 who is very much gen alpha she has that perspective too and I guess to this notion of creativity should be democratized everyone should have a part to play in it what do you think about that uh I do believe that creativity can come from anywhere often some of the best and most creative ideas do not come from the creative or marketing department but it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think maybe 20 years ago, if you told us that we would have an e-commerce category at Lions or one that is around business transformation, that would have been quite hard to believe. I think what we're seeing is 
brands, well, agencies specifically, getting much closer to the actual business problems at the heart of an organization to understand, for, again, from the inside out, how they can affect greater change and have more impact rather than just a campaign that might sit on surface level. So I think that's an interesting shift and one that will continue, I think. I'm so curious about that because, again, what I tend to be hearing is a lot of people questioning agency spend at the minute and saying, well, actually, is my agency delivering? And often agencies are billing on output. So that's what you get from an agency, you get 100 different creative outputs. And then AI is coming along and saying, hang on, I can do that for you. So what are you going to do there? And then the other thing I'm hearing, just your previous point, is in the skills gap of marketing, the skills gaps are really um, leaning towards strategic skills are lacking and everyone's moved towards tactical delivery because then at board level, you can say, well, we've shifted this and we put this out, but that strategic thinking around marketing and then I guess creative marketing, there is a bit of a gap. It does feel like we're not talking about marketing or advertising in the way that people did 10 or 15 years ago, the culture setting work that you used to have, like full moon, half moon, total eclipse. I bet you can recall the brand. What do we have yeah. today? Oh, I'd love Jaffa cake, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? <That's so> <laughs> um, I totally agree. And I think, you know, that does, that is something that comes out of the festival. You know, there are so many people that do a wrap up and talk about the themes and trends. And it's such a, it's such a trendy, transient industry that we're in. You kind of have these things that come along and they're quite disposable. In 22, the stages were dominated by talk about the metaverse. Mm. There was nothing in 2023 because the conversation had moved on to AI. I called it, Simon. <laughs> he called it first. Exactly. <laughs> yes, I think sometimes our community get a bit preoccupied with the new shiny thing and to learn about that. And what we are neglecting is some of those core skills that underpin everything that we do. So, you know, that's definitely something that we're trying to, to bake into the learning programs that we do, almost to return to that, those centers of excellence that need to be built up before you even start thinking about what your AI strategy is going to be that sits on top. Do you see AI as more of an augmentation or an acceleration, a replacement? Like, where do you place it in that value chain? I think it's here and here to stay. It didn't really show up in the work this year, but definitely will next year. But I think when people talk about, you know, the depth of our industry because of AI, I mean, that's wild. I mean, AI is the, is the Photoshop of the 80s. You know, it's cool. <laughs> Ooh. It's a tool. What a sound bite, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think we have to accept if there was a danger that there would be no human intervention, then I think we've got a concern. There will always yeah. be human intervention. And so if anything, it becomes just another tool that we use, hopefully to take away some of that more mundane work so that we can elevate our thinking and perhaps even get more strategic. Back to your point. Yeah, the mundane work fascinates me because I think like, not because I want we're to do We're back there again. We're back there again. More back, boring. Back boring. Yeah. <laughs> well, more because we were talking about, well, I've been talking to people about entry-level jobs at agencies, which back in the day you would do, and maybe you did in your early agency life, you'd do the contact report where you would be writing out all the notes and the minutes and then you'd find, like, put them all down and then you'd have to send them out within 24 hours. Da -da -da. And AI can just do all of that now. So the entry point into the industry is different, but also the expectation of the 22-year-old, 23-year-old coming into the job market is vastly different because to Simone's point, they may have been creating for six to seven years on a platform like TikTok. And then with that, the way I see, for example, my nephew, who's a similar age to Simone's daughter, using technology, I think God, when that enters the workforce, that's really powerful because they're learning with AI and they're using ChatGPT to go, that's going to do 80% of what I need and then I'm going to craft 20%, which I think is going to be a fundamental shift for a lot of leaders to work out. And I guess I'm just saying all of this to go, how are you seeing it? Are you using AI, given that you're a graphic designer and probably use Photoshop, not in the 80s, but later on, but... Is, is AI now your, your new tool that you work with? 
I, th I think businesses should experiment with it to see how it can best work for them. I mean, our sister brands, Contagious and Walk, obviously there's a lot of, there's a big editorial focus there. And so it's fascinating getting into conversations with our editorial teams about the use of it, what's correct, where it's going, and perhaps even the need for disclaimers. We've been talking with our awards team recently about whether there is a need on the entry form itself for a disclaimer in 23 or 24 next year, which I think is right not to call it out as a bad behavior, but just whilst we are all getting our heads around AI and its impact, yeah. just Helpful signposting, I think, is is probably the most transparent thing to do. Well, it's a bit like those things, you know, with the, the crown telling us it's not actually the crown or the real monarchy. You get the disclaimer at the beginning that says this is fictional. Something to say right. could be quite fun. I've got loads of questions, but Simone, I'm sure you've got you've got some. I'm actually thinking about the skills bit and thinking about the young lions proposition that you also have, Simon. Um, and you talked at the beginning about creativity being one of the most underutilized tools. And I'm really reflecting on the lack of focus on creativity in schools, in education. It's not a new conversation, but in the world of everything else becoming so automated and systematized, almost creativity and problem solving are going to be the only things left that you need humans to do. What are you seeing in terms of that shift? of where young people are focusing or what do they need to be harnessing in terms of those skills to be able to enter into the creativity workforce? I think it's a brilliant point because if you look consistently at the, the predicted skills needed, I think it's on the World Economic Forum for the next 10 years, creativity or creative problem solving is usually one or two. Yeah. Which is just mad considering you know that we have creativity falling off curriculums around yeah, the world yeah yeah have you turned to more kind of um you know exam-based learning where it's about just remembering facts and figures rather than the things we can google so yeah i think there's a massive disconnect there and i think that's hopefully where we can play a role through initiatives like the young lions competitions which bring people who'd like to, to step into our industry, a chance to do that. And then alongside that, the um, expanding talent programs and scholarships that we're creating, mm. which especially underrepresented communities, a chance to attend and get closer to our industry because they would never normally have the opportunity to do that. But at the same time, we are hopefully widening the pool of candidates who could be coming through the door, again, taking us back to DEI and that being better for relevance of businesses. You have such a unique point of view of who a creative is. So in this country, there's such a stereotype of who a creative is or what it looks like. Whereas I imagine then when you look around the world, do you see any stereotypes of what creative or creatives around the world look like? I think if we're talking about sort of individuals in what you might consider a classic agency, you know, a picture pops into everyone's mind. Um, the thing I think was really interesting about the juries this year, especially because of the composition we went after, is that you had so many different types of people colliding and so many different types of thinking colliding. Yeah. So you only go into a creative data jury to be able to see what a, a sort of new breed of creative looks like and different types of people geeking out over data and the influence and impact that can have when combined with creativity. So I think the stereotype is shifting because we are starting to rethink the very definition of creativity itself. That in itself is very lovely because I think part of that picture is what holds people back or says, oh, I don't, I don't think I fit that mold um, and work with that. And I think speaking of, of molds, you're a CEO and all the people have expectations of who a CEO is and what a CEO does. One of the things I remember from talking to you is you're an introvert and you own that. And we were just talking about how introversion plays out because CEOs are often seen as very extroverted and out on stage and talking all the time. And I was wondering about how you've smashed that stereotype as an introverted CEO. Yeah, I think by 
owning it, to use your phrase. Um, I, I can't be anything other than this. Right. I think it would be damaging to to mask up and try and be an extroverted alpha male CEO every day. I think that would you know be damaging. And I've definitely had days where I may have tried that on and it doesn't feel good. I think there is a responsibility to try and be authentic as, as hard as that sometimes is in and of itself. Yeah. In order to set the example for your team to be able to do exactly the same. Rick Dan, so we've been talking a lot at the moment about how tired people are feeling. Yes. Yeah. Are you feeling that? There's just this real fatigue. Yeah. And not just here in London. I was just in Brazil and was fortunate enough to meet many um, execs there from our community. And it was really interesting. We were hosting a, a lunch and I was being a good host and greeting everyone at the door at the, as they came in. And it was, it was really interesting to hear everyone come in and go, oh, I'm really tired. You know, I feel really spent at the moment. So something's afoot, definitely. What do you think is sitting underneath that that's happening on a global level? I think during the pandemic, we all went into overdrive and, and there are different drivers there. For some people in, in parts of the world, it's because they were scared they were going to lose their job. Or they might have been in an industry that was massively affected by the pandemic. So there was a real fear, fear there. I think also because of proximity to office and, you know, being removed, different kind of fear and insecurity, lack of validation. And people got busy during the pandemic, often because they were changing their own business models. You know, we had to go completely digital for two years, which we'd never done before. And then coming back to whatever this is now, because we're still in some kind of weird hybrid. <laughs> yeah. um, I think that has continued. And I think that pace has continued. And we haven't had a slowdown moment. I was talking to, to you both, I think, a while ago about this kind of freezing, unfreezing yeah. situation. Yeah. We, went, we went through this weird unfreezing of, our, of the way we normally do things during the pandemic. And I yeah. don't yet, we've refrozen yet. And, and yeah. that underlying uncertainty, I think, is still driving that slightly frenetic pace, which is, I, you know, there's other pressures as well, but I think that is a factor. Do you know, that that really sticks with me because if you unfreeze for too long, you just become liquid and it's all just wet on the floor and you've literally got no reserves in the freezer to then take back out and refuel. Mm. I, I, I can really feel that. And I'm also noticing people say, 2023, they're doing a comparator on 2019. Mm. Lots of people say that was the last normal year. Right. And I find that really fascinating because we operate on this Gregorian year that we have to compare back to and have business comparators and year on year growth or whatever. But then what are the learnings from 2020 to 22 that did either drive exponential growth or create real change that we also, we almost want to just put away and go, let's go back to how it was in 2019, which maybe it's happened for you because you had a very ex extraordinary couple of years where I imagine all the metrics changed versus what they yeah. were in 2019. Yeah, completely. I think, um, the desire to get back to 2019, you know, after going through that, that period of change where we were, were all saying things will never be the same again. And that's yeah. like, right. And move forward and abandon some of those flabby behaviors of the past if anything it feels like there is this underlying drive to get back to exactly how we were in 2019 with number of days increasing maybe this time last year we were back to one or two days it's crept up to three in some cases four so there is this um subconscious desire to get back to normality as we perhaps subconsciously see it i think we all just need to listen to mel c a bit more and realize things will never be the same again I just want to hear that. <laughs> As my favorite, one of my favorite Spice Girls solos. And she can actually know number two. Which, <laughs> yeah. um, and then what does ATU used to know the other day? Bag it up. That's also a good one. Um, but okay. that's deep into Jerry's dubious solo career. Honestly, <laughs> it's a lot we could talk about with Jerry Halliwell. But um, coming back to like refreezing and like, so we, we just hosted something called the Recharge. Yeah, yeah. tell me more. Well, it was great. Like Frank was there, Jenny came along and uh, Jenny from your team, not Jenny from the block. And we were talking about, um, we were reflecting on 
like what people need right now to recharge and find energy to that point about methods. Where do you go for that? Where's, where's your place of recharge? Uh, well, we were talking about it earlier. Once a year, I like to have, and it can be a short holiday. You know, it might be a week. I'm lucky, but a solo holiday. You know, a chance where I can really do uh, deep reflection, deep thinking. That's really important to me. And then I think on a, on a daily basis, um, I walk to work every day. And that is sometimes painful because of the British weather. Is that come rain or shine? Come rain or shine. I'll be pounding the pavement or Regent's Canal to be specific. And that takes an hour and a half. And that's quite yeah. long, but it is a brilliant amount of time to turn your phone off, not use it for calls or to check emails on the go, but just to reconnect with my brain for an hour and a half, because it's really hard to find the time to be able to take a thought on a walk unless I do that. You know, I think we were, I think that's really interesting because Simone, I was saying to you a couple of weeks ago about having a 20 minute cycle to and from work and it just not feeling mm. like enough. So then you take a train and you get that break as well. I have to have a commute. I think that's the one thing when I work from home, you know, there are lots of, there are lots of benefits to that, but I miss that bit of commute where actually it's just that in between I'm not at home. I'm not at work. I get to have a bit of thinking and a bit of space. Um, now, sometimes I turn the tunes right up, which means I'm not thinking, but <laughs> I'm just raving on my way to work. But yeah, it's just that bit of pause. And that's, that's the thing I'm missing in, I guess, the everyday is I'm not, I'm not getting enough pauses. Um, and that's what I'm really trying to intentionally create. I think that moving from one mindset to another is really important. I think during the lockdown, I obviously couldn't do that walk to work every day. So I would just be doing laps of Victoria Park from one mindset to another. Because, um, yeah, otherwise, as you say, there is no space to pause, give your brain a break, or to use it to, you know, as I was saying to address that earlier, just take a thought a bit further. I don't think we're given the chunks of time to be able to do deep thinking in the way that we probably need to. We've covered so much in the last 45 minutes or so. What would you say, Simon, makes you unmistakable? Oh, wow. Nicely done. Um, makes me unmistakable. I think the fact that I'm willing to, I'm willing to give it a go. I'm willing to try, even if it's completely unfamiliar or it's outside of my comfort zone. Now, as it was when we first started working together, by the way, but I will give it a go and I'll give it my all. Hopefully that makes me unmistakable. I absolutely love that because that's what I was saying to Frank and Jenny last week. I can't remember what year it was, but we were a small low business then and you went, they get it. I think the, our journey has been very interlinked with Trend Lions and what you've been setting out to achieve. So I love that. That's a lovely answer. And we are the better for it. So thank you very much. It's been, for me, a career highlight and something that everyone at The Unmistakables has been involved in in some way or another and feel so proud to see the journey that you're on, but you've gone so beyond commitments, which lots of people have, and actually really into action and it's inspiring. Thank you very much. Thank you well, very well. much. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming on to the Speak Easy Simon. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Thanks um, very much for having me. Good to see you both. That was a great conversation with Simon. How did you find that? Yeah, good. I always learn something when I chat to Simon, whether it's about introversion and leadership or a view on the industry that I think is so unique when you hold that role and you meet so many different people uh, across the industry. So yeah, I feel like I'm coming away with a few things to mull over and maybe go into a bit of deep thinking and stretching thoughts. I love this, the idea of a solo retreat. <laughs> I'll be exploring that for myself. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, exactly that. So that was another episode of the Speak Easier. As usual, you can find us at all the social places at underscore unmistakables. And thanks for joining for another episode, Simone. Pleasure. See you soon.